I also saw an interview with Rob Bell on uh, MSNBC. I don't know, and it was really, uh, the person uh, was very unfriendly. He says, so either God, uh, because he, this happened uh, uh, at the time, remember the tsunami in Japan, when uh, so many people were killed. So this person on MSNBC, they immediately were attacking Rob Bell and saying, so either God is, has no capacity to save people and doesn't care, uh, and he lets people die, or uh, God is all-powerful, almighty, uh, and he chooses to not save people. Which one is it? Which one is it? You know, it's, but it's neither. It's neither. You know, the, the key to understanding the reality of the situation with God is understanding what True Father tried to explain to us. It all goes back to understanding the concept of mind and body unity, the concept of material and spiritual reality, and what is the relationship between our life here in this physical reality and the nature of our eternal existence. Because whenever you hear people going on and on about, well, why did God let this happen? Why did God let that happen? Those people died. They're innocent. They died. But if you look at the reality of the nature of life, death is a part of our existence. From the beginning of time until now, everybody is going to die. Everybody dies. We have a limited time in this physical life. The question is, and this is the part, unfortunately, that no religious people have been able to explain or understand, is what is the nature of the connection or the relationship between our life here and our eternal future. Christianity has always been completely vague, completely in the dark about life after death. When I was growing up as a Christian in this area, uh, the whole concept of, of the idea of people having near-death experiences and so forth, it was treated as, oh, you know, that's, you know, that's mysticism. That's uh, false doctrines or those people are, you know, they're lying to you or, you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's evil. But through history, through history, people have on occasions have been able to touch and become aware of the fact that when a person passes away and dies, that's not the end of their existence. And unfortunately, Christianity hasn't been able to understand this. Let's look at some Bible quotes. Jesus warns, and I'm sure uh, Reverend, Reverend Graham would be one of the first to point this out, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Constantly, the Bible re refers to fire and judgment all the time, even Jesus himself. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. What is, what is the fruit of a person? It is by the way that they live, by their lifestyle by their relationships with the people around them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. What kind of a person is a person who prophesies and does all these things. In whose name? In Jesus' name. 
in my name, in the name of Jesus. And yet Jesus is warning and saying, be careful, because I might not even recognize you. Why? Because of your actions, because of the content of your life. Not, it doesn't matter what you say. Words, words are cheap. Theology, the, you know, debating and arguing and, and, and going back and forth, intellectualizing. It's okay to do those things, but in the end, Jesus was very clear. You are going to be measured. You're going to be judged. You're going to be held accountable by the content of your character and your life. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So Jesus is saying, if you practice and the words that I'm telling you, then when trouble comes, when problems come, when life becomes difficult, I will be with you. You will be on a foundation and you will be able to handle it. But if you don't live a life centered on this love of this practice of true love, then when the trouble comes, when the difficulties come, when you're challenged, you will fall away. You, you won't be able to stand. Then it says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Meaning, they felt not only his sincerity, but they understood the content of what he was saying was profound and deep and clear. And they realized, wow, if I compare this man, Jesus, what he's teaching me and what he's sharing with me to these scribes, these Pharisees, these other, you know, supposedly well-educated people, clearly I can feel, I can sense his authority. You know, Jesus also in Matthew, this is a story about how it says, at that time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain to eat them. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God. And he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple desecrate the day and yet are innocent? I tell you that one greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. What is Jesus talking about? If you had known what these words mean, that I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He's referring to two times in the Bible. I'll get back to that. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there, looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into the pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. Same principle. These religious leaders are saying, ah, 
You know, the law says this. The law says this. The law says this. And Jesus was trying to explain to them, the law is the law, but the heart is the heart. And he's trying to explain to them. Then he, so he heals a person right in front of their eyes. This man's shriveled hand becomes whole. And look what it says. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. They saw him heal a person. Didn't matter. They didn't care. It wasn't important to them. It was irrelevant because they were so locked, so locked into their concept that even no matter what good Jesus did, no matter what good he showed, because of the, 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 the commitment that they had to their doctrine, it didn't matter. In their mind, in their heart, oh, he's even more evil. He's doing this by the power of the devil. How twisted. The Son of God was seen to be Satan. Going back, why did Jesus talk about mercy and not sacrifice? In Hosea 6, uh, this is one of the prophets. He's saying, what can I do with you, Ephraim? This is God speaking through the prophet. Even in the Old Testament time, God wanted to educate the people. What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. Therefore, I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I kill you with the words of my mouth. My judgments flash like lightning upon you. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God, rather than burnt offerings. Tradition, you know, uh, doing things in a lawful, legal way, has its place, has its purpose. Also in Micah, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He's saying, well, what do you want? What if I bring all these things to God? What if I give God everything I have, even if I offer him my firstborn? Is that what God wants? He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Even in the Old Testament, the message was there. And Jesus came 2,000 years later to embody that love, mercy, compassion. That was everything about Jesus' life. So, what about us and our true parents then? What about the fact that we know how many conditions in the early age, that when we first joined our church and our movement, how many times did we make conditions? But if we study and learn and really look clearly at True Father's life course and his teaching and his explanation, we can understand the meaning behind all of it. You see, here in, in October, in 1978, at the eight-year anniversary of the 7-7 seven, seven couples, he said, earlier I spoke about Hope Church, the final barrier that we in the unification movement have to go through. Since we cannot fulfill our mission without going through this last gateway, let me speak again about this topic. Originally, if man had not fallen, there would have been no necessity for even the words home church. The completed, perfected family of Adam and Eve would have become the family which could have directly attended God and naturally communicated with the angelic world. This family would have produced children, formed their tribe and their nation, and eventually the whole world, and would have become the world of Adam's family. Not to be confused with the TV show, The Adam's Family. The world of Adam's family. A world of family. Therefore, we are destined 
to follow the course of the providence of restoration. A person cannot go this path alone. He or she needs the help of God and the spirit world. Therefore, God and the spirit world have been mobilized to help fallen man on earth complete the history of recreation. There's, I mean, God completely took charge and guided people for all this time. God gave guidance to Cain and Abel. God revealed himself to Noah. God spoke to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and directly, personally guided them, knowing clearly everything that needed to be done. But those people, they hear the voice of God and they hear God telling them to do something. They had no idea, no idea what was going on in terms of the providence of restoration. But they obeyed and they followed. And so God himself created after for through thousands of years, he created a providence of restoration, also with the spiritual world mobilized. God created man, and after he had created the physical world, therefore the restoration of man must start after the restoration of material things. In order to restore material things, people in the Old Testament age made offerings to God using things from the creation. Such offerings united God, the spirit world, and the creation into a substantial foundation. Through these successful offerings, the foundation to restore a substantial Adam was begun. So why did people make offerings and offer things of the creation, lambs and whatever was of value? Because the material things were more pure and closer to God. So this was a way of people beginning to do things that would change their character, their personality. They learned to sacrifice. Oh, I really want this lamb. I'm hungry. I want to eat it. But God said, no, I want you to kill it and burn it up and, and offer it to me. Oh, man, I don't want to do that. But they did. And as people did these little things, seemingly strange things, their hearts changed. They began to, to understand the idea of sacrificing, of offering, of giving to something that is higher than yourself. It was a training. But then... Through these successful offerings, the foundation to restore a substantial Adam was begun. It was begun, and then it was completed. And when it was completed, God could send Jesus to bring us to a higher level. This foundation of offering was supposed to be established worldwide. To do that, a particular nation, Israel, was elected. It was God's hope that Israel would become the most important nation in the world. So that when the foundation was completed there, it would represent the world. On that kind of foundation, perfected Adam and Eve would be able to stand. The New Testament age started when Jesus Christ, who came with the purpose of completing God's will, became the offering. This offering expanded worldwide as Christianity grew and prepared the environment for the restoration of all mankind. Therefore, among all religions, Christianity became the central religion. However, its foundation is only the, on the spiritual level. So Christianity is the center because Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He was very different and very special and, and worthy of our praise and our honor. And he truly was God's Son, as uh, the, the Bible teaches. There's no doubt. If man had not fallen, the original standard would have been the perfection of both body and spirit. So since Christianity has only a spiritual foundation, the matter of the second advent becomes important. God has been developing Christianity, the second Israel, on a worldwide basis in order to lay the foundation to receive the Messiah, who will come as a substantial person. His task is to restore, through indemnity, the foundation of perfected Adam who is the center of the whole world, and to unify both body and spirit, physical and spiritual. A person must come who can embody and accomplish and fulfill the ideal of a true person, a true man, becoming a person of true love. The unification movement arose out of the need for a perfected person who can unify body and spirit on the foundation of worldwide Christianity. That person stands in the unfallen position and has the responsibility to establish 
the ideal of God's love worldwide. In the Old Testament age, blood was shed through offerings. In the New Testament age, martyrs shed blood, offering their lives to advance God's will. Jesus represented the ultimate, the most extreme example of, of giving one's life for the sake of others. Jesus said, no higher love is there than to be willing to give your life for the sake of another person. But Jesus didn't come to die and give his physical life as, as an offering. He came to live and establish a tradition of true love where people have mercy and not sacrifice. Who had mercy for Jesus? Nobody. Instead, they sacrificed him. And for thousands of years, Christianity has recognized the sacrifice of Jesus. And on that foundation, God created a worldwide foundation of a culture. Not a, a religion of Christianity. It's not the religion of Christianity that, that affected the world. It's the culture. It's the culture of that heart. That heart that Jesus demonstrated and has demonstrated for thousands of years. The heart of being able to give your life for another person. Even an enemy. Even, a, even if you don't understand, I don't know what's going on. But I know this. I'm going to give my life. I'm going to give my life for something higher than myself. God honors that kind of sacrifice. But that, that's not the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is where we love and support each other. In the Old Testament age, blood was shed through offerings. In the New Testament age, martyrs shed blood, offering their lives to advance God's will. In this age of the unification movement, blood is shed through sacrificial love. Due to the fall, mankind lost God, the angelic world, and a true relationship with the physical world. People lost their grip on true love. To reach the goal of that true love, we have to go the way of sacrifice, which is in a sense the shedding of artistic blood. That is the mission of this movement. The shedding of artistic blood. Even, even God doesn't want us to, to physically die. He doesn't want us to physically suffer. God never wishes physical suffering on anybody. What parent wants their children to be uncomfortable or to be in pain? But the physical world is a world of physical reality. And things are going to happen. God always knew things would happen. But when our hearts are in the right place, even the physical suffering, the physical sacrifice, we recognize and understand someday, someday, it, there will be a reward. That, that this, this is the mission of this movement, to shed artistic blood, to change our heart. You must understand that the path which I have been following on behalf of the individual, the family, the nation, and the whole world is the way of the cross of love. If this movement fails to follow the way of the cross of love, it cannot complete God's will. But if it gains the victory, it can promote God's will and bring about the age of the heavenly kingdom here on earth. This is what true parents are about. The age of religion is gone. Even in our own movement, the age of religion has disappeared and is gone. The traditions, the old way of doing things, we must recognize and understand and observe the, the direction that God is guiding us now. We are meant to become the embodiment of that true love. Then what is the family? The family is the place where God can be welcomed, 
Originally, the family was to create the central foundation to attend God. <coughs> but this was lost at the fall. Also because of the fall, people could not establish a vertical relationship with the angelic world. Therefore, we must restore a direct relationship with the spirit world during our horizontal physical lives. The family is the place for doing that. In the family, we can also prepare the foundation for the restoration of material things and stand in the position representing perfected Adam or God's true child. And finally, centering upon God, through becoming substantial parents, we can fulfill our responsibility to perfect the unity of spirit and body. That is, God's sphere of unified heart. That is the internal responsibility of the unification church. Look again. Finally, by becoming parents ourselves, we fulfill the responsibility of the unity of spirit and body. Spirit and body, unity of spirit and body. What does it mean? It means having a parental heart. Having a parental heart is your mind and your body being united. Being able to make the sacrifice for your children. Even when your children are crying and you wake up, you know, babies cry and you've got to wake up, you're tired, your physical body is aching or tired, but you get up and you give and you, you, you take care of your children. You work hard every day and you make money and sacrifice and then where does the money go? You know, you spend it all on your own food and your own video games? Or no. Most of it goes for your family to support and to help because the heart, the heart, so physical and spiritual are united, centered on the heart of true love. Those are the lessons we're meant to learn in the family. And we can learn those lessons. True parents perfected. True parents perfected this heart, this ability to sacrifice and to serve and to give from the individual level to the family, to the tribe, to the nation, to the world. What is the difference between the unification church and traditional religions? The primary purpose of the existing traditional religions has been the salvation of individuals. Many religions developed and expanded by preaching only about how to perfect the ideal personality. But the Unification Church was formed to bring the perfection of the family. In the past, in order to be saved through any of the individualistic religions, all that was required was that a person offer and dedicate himself on the individual level. But this is now the age of the perfection of the family, which will happen only if we are able to make an offering of our own families. Unification church members do not start their family life immediately after they receive the blessing from God. Oh, I remember this well. After they are blessed, they are supposed to start an official three-year course of separation. Why? Before we can have our own families, we must make indemnity conditions to restore the historical background of fallen families and the many families today who are not God-centered. Why are we doing these conditions? It's not because we made some mistake. It's not by any fault of our own. We're doing it because they aren't doing it. Because they don't know and they can't do it. We do it for them. So that someday their family will become like our family and be able to enjoy having a relationship with God. We do it to restore the historical background of fallen families and the many families today who are not God-centered. Then what is the relationship between your family and the families in the secular world? To use the terminology of the Unification Church, your family is the internal, able-type family, and the secular families are the external, Cain-type families. Before Unification Church members were given the blessing, the division into Abel and Cain was on the individual level. But with the advent of the blessing, the division into Abel and Cain was established on the level of families. The division 
was established. How did the division come? What created the division? Love. But wait a minute. How can love divide? Well, the way love divides is when a higher standard of love comes. If a higher standard of love appears, then the lower standard suddenly becomes less attractive. It becomes less useful. It becomes, sometimes, the lower standard of love will actually be, become an inhibitor, a wall, a barrier to the higher standard of love. That's exactly what happened to Jesus. Jesus, clearly, when we read the scriptures and study, we think, how could those people be like that toward Jesus? Well, watch the news today. Look at how people treat each other today. <laughs> Listen to the debates. <laughs> Democrats, Republicans, talking. You know, uh, last week, some news guy from, I guess it was from Fox, he went to Yale University and he took out a, a clipboard and he had a camera with him and he, you know, he was being filmed and he went up and he started interviewing the students at Yale and he said, listen, we want to repeal the First Amendment. You know, the First Amendment, the First Amendment is, uh, amends the Constitution of the United States. It guarantees freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, freedom of assembly and freedom to petition. Petition, you know, take names and get things changed. We want to repeal that because it's an old doctrine from these, you know, guys from four, 300, 200 something years ago. Can you please, you know, we're gonna repeal the First Amendment, you know, because, you know, people shouldn't be free to talk. They, I mean, people say nasty things to you. Don't you get angry when people are always telling you nasty things? Yeah, yeah. Well, here, let's repeal the First Amendment. Student after student after student after student. In an hour, it got 50 signatures. 50 signatures of students at Yale University signing a petition to make it illegal for them to sign a petition. <laughs> signing a petition to make it illegal for them to follow any particular faith. Signing a petition to make it illegal for them to assemble in groups of people. Signing a petition to make it illegal for them uh, to, to be able to uh, uh, write anything in a newspaper that they want. They all signed it. And at first, uh, the rest of the media caught hold of this and they thought it was a joke. They really thought this was, this was a parody. No, this wasn't a real video, this was a joke video. It wasn't a joke video. That's, that's, that's the, the level of some thinking now. But it's because words are cheap. <laughs> Talk is cheap. You don't want people to say nasty things to you, do you? No, I don't. Here, sign here. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's so easy. It sounds like it's so easy, right? Well, let's just make a law. I'm tired of these people of you. Let's make a law. That's not how life works. But it's very interesting. <clears throat> Yale University is where many of our presidents came from. <laughs> so since that time, Yale's, Yale University, and a lot of the students there actually, they woke up and they started saying, hey, you know, this doesn't represent us. And there, there was one girl, the, the guy said there was one girl who said, oh, the First Amendment, well, I'm, what is the First Amendment? And he said what the First Amendment was. And then he had a copy of it there. So he let her read it. So she read the First Amendment. And then she said, yeah, all right, I'll sign it. <laughs> funny, but it's not funny. But it's because people, people, we're living in an age where information is just coming and going so quickly. You know, how seriously are we really, you know, do we really put our feet down? Do we really root ourselves in our, in our daily life? Are we really experiencing life? You know? Are we really experiencing life or have we started just floating? Are we just floating across the internet? You know? Are we, is our mind thinking of the past all the time and the future to the point where we're not even here in the moment, enjoying life? The definition of unity of mind and body 
is to be here now. To be here now. And to see things clearly. From the spiritual side and the physical side. Science and religion. Internal and external. Mind and body. And it all comes together centered on true love. True love is the force that brings the spiritual and the physical together. The sphere of family centered upon God expands through the blessing. By attending our true parents, these families inherit the internal heart of heaven. As these families expand horizontally, they form tribes and nations. Furthermore, you may be Korean, but your family is not limited to the Korean people. It is worldwide, transcending national or cultural boundaries. So even if your family is kin or park, its members are not just individuals, but representatives of mankind and the whole world. All blessed families. We are representatives of the world. We are not individuals anymore. And God doesn't look at us as individuals, and he doesn't treat us as individuals. And so if your life is going through difficulties and, and struggles, then don't think that this is because of you. You know, God wants our struggles to be for the world, for the benefit of all. So learn your lessons and become a better person through it. In other words, you must understand that your families represent the whole world, beyond tribes, beyond nations, beyond cultures. You have been given that kind of responsibility. Centering upon true parents, our family foundation has advanced from 36 families to 72 families and so on, expanding the foundation of restoration through indemnity up to the worldwide basis. Father's speech goes on, but at this point, this was 1978. At this time, remember, communism was real and powerful, and there was persecution against our movement, and there were Christian leaders and religious leaders, and there were political leaders, and there were campus or, you know, people were against our, our movement. And even Father was yet to face Stanbury. To be dragged in front of the, 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 the courts in the United States, accused of cheating the U.S. government out of, out of uh, what, $7,500 over a period of three years. Put in jail for 13 months for not, for not paying the equivalent of about $2,500 worth of taxes on money that he didn't even own. I mean, you know, that's, obviously I'm a biased person up here being the pastor of the church, but I read the book. If you ever want to know the truth about what happened to Father in Danbury, then you need to read the book Inquisition. Okay? It wasn't written by any of our members. It was written by a man who spent his life as an adult researching religious frauds. And he exposed uh, fraud in different churches and showed how these churches were ripping people off of their money. And he got a job at the Washington Times as a reporter because he wanted to expose the Unification Church. And he wanted to show the truth about how Reverend Moon had ripped off America and the world because he knew about the trial. And so he joined, he secretly became a member of the Washington Times staff. Well, he didn't secretly become a member. He became a member, but he didn't tell people why he was there. He became friends with our members. Tom McDivitt, and, you know, different people working there. Started going to their homes, to their barbecues. And started, you know, researching, getting papers and the book work and the financial records, etc., etc. Then he discovered, wait a minute. What's going on here? I can't, I can't find any false records here. I can't find any secret bank accounts hidden in you know, the Cayman Islands. There's no Swiss bank accounts. You know, what's going on? Look at all these records. I mean, this guy's been giving millions of dollars to these black churches. He's been spending millions of dollars having people come to these dinners. He's been spending millions of dollars for, he invested in this, you know, the Washington Times, this newspaper I work for is losing a million dollars a month. A million dollars a month is being thrown away in this newspaper that I'm getting a salary from. What, what's going on? 
Then he started researching everything from the viewpoint of the government. He started interviewing government officials. And he wrote the book, Inquisition. And he showed how Reverend Moon was railroaded, how the, 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 the you know, the prosecuting attorneys and everybody, they had an agenda. And they pushed the agenda through. That's a side note. But what's it all for? It's all for the creation of true families so that we become people of true love. After you receive the blessing, you still have to walk the path of witnessing and the way of faith. The fact that we have been blessed does not mean that we have achieved a stronger position than the secular world. When we formed blessed families, there were already clans and tribes in the secular world. Even if we establish a sphere of God's dominion on the national level, the secular world has already established nations, and they already have their own world. Therefore, we still have the task of establishing God's domain on the level of the world. So the conditions that we made, the, the sacrifices that you and I were asked to do, were not a punishment. They were not because, oh, you know, for thousands of years people made these traditions, so we should do them too. They were for a very logical, clear reason. There, there was still the threat of communism taking over the world. There's still people following false teachings and false doctrines, and there's still people there that might make our movement illegal or might come in and shoot our members, you know, get rid of us. So Father is saying we have to expand our foundation to where we reach this level of safety where we are free, free to exist and to create God's ideal. God's blessing has been given within this world of satanic dominion. Therefore, there are still stages for us to go through. Individual blessed families must go on to the levels of tribe, society, nation, and world. The final level we must reach is that of the heavenly kingdom. That's it. The final level. Well, what do you think? We reach the final level or not? Yes and no. Obviously, there are still very bad people out there, right? There are still people out there who believe evil things. They believe destructive things. They believe unprincipled things. And they act out in this way based on what they believe. The question is, do those people have the power, the authority, the ability to prevent God's providence from advancing? And the answer is absolutely not. Everything that's happening in our world at this time is not happening in one sense on a cosmic level. The cosmic or the universal or the world level is changing from the top down, from the spiritual world. The spiritual world is changing. And we, who are the blessed families here, from, who started from the bottom moving up, are moving toward the ideal. So God is coming down from on high. God is in charge. God is in control. God is guiding people through their original mind. And we are here to create the environment, to make the environment so that God can work so that God can exercise his power and his authority. I believe this with all my mind and all my heart. That is what true parents did. They are the Messiah. They are the true parents. They established the foundation to establish the kingdom of heaven. We are the blessed families. We know the tradition. We know the standard of true love. And even though we make mistakes, we're not always there, we're human like anybody else, still we have the authority, we have the ability to love. Any other teaching, any other doctrine, any other 
profession, outside or inside, this movement is not principled. This is clearly, clearly what true parents have accomplished and achieved. And then father went to the spirit world. He's gone. He's not coming back. Father's not going to come back like Jesus came back. We should pray that Father doesn't come back. We should be praying, Father, leave us alone. Stay away. We know what we have to do. It's okay. Please, Father, go. Stay there. Enjoy. Deal with the people there. You know, there's enough, there's enough evil people that lived in the spiritual world, right? People that never knew God on this earth, that suffered, and they went into the spirit world. It's not like when Jesus died. When Jesus died, he had to come back. He had to resurrect. He had to reappear to his disciples. It was absolutely crucial and essential because everything was still had to be accomplished on this earth. The earth was still under the dominion of Satan. That's not the case anymore. That's not true anymore. That's a lie. This world is not under the dominion of Satan. It's under the dominion of God. But satanic influence is still here. There's still angry, resentful, frustrated, confused people. And therefore, it's our responsibility to set an example and a standard of true love. And there are people that are doing that. God's blessing has been given within this world of the satanic dominion. Therefore, there are still stages for us to go through. You may think that the blessing is all you need, but that is not true. When you receive the blessings, you are not in the position to overcome the secular world completely and go beyond it to the kingdom of heaven. You were blessed within the satanic world, and your blessing established able-type families. The Cain world, which is ahead of us externally, will not immediately acknowledge and obey someone whose position they consider inferior. They will certainly try to persecute us and crush us. We have to go through a process to win them over. And we did. And we did. 1978, 2016, coming. We did it. True parents did it. God did it. True parents did it. The blessed families did it. Absolutely. Fast forward. Here we are, sitting in this room. We did it. And God is working in an amazing way in this world. And I know there are bad things happening out there, but if you really look closely, you'll see everything's happening now on the family level, the, the, the tribal and family level. You know, God in every nation. God is in every nation. True, Blessed couples are in every nation. Blessed couples are in Syria. Blessed couples are in Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan. Every nation of Africa has blessed families. You know, what does it mean? It means God's spirit can be there. God's spirit can be there. Absolutely. Did you hear this story? Fulton High School football player. He was killed by random bullets fired in a gang shooting when he dove on top of three girls to shield them from rounds. The Knoxville Police Chief, David Rausch, choked back tears Friday at the news conference when he described how the 15-year-old Fulton sophomore acted as a human shield to spare three girls' injury from a fusillade of bullets fired by three men. About a dozen people were in the area when the shooting began. No other injuries were reported. I don't know if you saw this story or not. I watched the interview with the police chief. Broke down in tears. Completely in tears. This was just a gang shooting. This was, you know, black on black crime in a neighborhood. But this one young man, at that very moment when the bullets started coming, he grabbed these three girls that were near him and he covered them. He died and they lived. He was the only one shot in the whole thing. That's, 
That's a beautiful story. These are the people that we need to think about and honor and remember. When you hear stories of the terrible things that are happening, equally, for, for every bad situation, for every person who's unprincipled, for every person who's, who's confused or who's, you know, who's believing a lie, there are those people who are there prepared to do the right thing. Even a 15-year-old student, just by his, by his nature, by his, uh, his character, his personality, whatever it was, in that moment, in that moment. So we need to know true love. True love wins always. True love is going to win always. God is in control. The Messiah came. Can you imagine? We're sitting in this room. Out there every Sunday at church, they continue to go on and on about Jesus, the second coming. Look, look at what's happening in Syria. Look at what's happening in, in, in Iran, Iraq. Oh my God, this is the end time. Oh, look at Israel's being attacked. It's about to happen. The end days, the, the second coming. Jesus is coming soon. <coughs> but he's not. He's not coming soon. He already came. He fulfilled, completed everything. It's incredible, but it's true. So we, each one of us here, we must be clear. We must be clear of who we are. We, we're so blessed. And every, every person around us can be so blessed. The blessing of God. Love wins. True love wins always. Absolutely. You know, it just, it's just so, in some ways, obvious. And yet I know, I'll admit, I'm going to admit, I, I stand up here and I say these things, and I know in my mind, in my heart, these things are true. This is the true, clear explanation. This is my, my whole life. I have thrown my lot into, I have, you know, I have, you know, put my, the, what's the saying, once you put your hands to the plow, you know, don't look back, you know, I, I have thrown my lot in with true father and true mother, with the true parents. I am committed. I'm 61 years old. So I'm not going to change. This is it. But I'm very confident. I'm very confident that this is the correct understanding of, of, of the principle of who true parents are. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what anyone else says. Like, like I almost played the Doobie Brothers, Jesus is just all right with me. In this song it says, I don't care what they may say. I don't care what they may do. I don't care what they may say. Father and mother are just all right with me. Yeah. You know? And it's all clear. It's clear. If, if, you're, if you're willing to pray and re reflect and look, it's clear. It's very clear. Don't be fooled by, by people with interesting ideas and you know who want to be the ones that are in charge of whatever. I don't know what they want to be in charge of anymore. It's nothing to be in charge of except our own lives, living a life centered on God and goodness. If you're not sure if true parents' marriage is real, how many times did they get blessed? They, they got blessed to each other three times, I think. So father and mother together, they did it. They established the tradition. They're the first ones, and we are, are behind them. We are like them, following them. And all of the true children, the same thing. It doesn't matter what they say or what they do now. Eventually, they're, or they're always the true children. They're always going to be with father or mother on one level or another. But don't doubt. Don't doubt the victory of true parents. What, what, a, what a shame. And what if, what if what if I'm wrong? Okay, suppose, suppose I'm wrong and someone else is right. I mean, after all these years, what, God is going to hold that against me? God is going to say something like, when I go to the spirit world, God's going to say, whoa, you really should have, you know, that son over there, you really should have listened to him instead of a true mother. 
I said, yeah, but God, I mean, I didn't live with Mother. I didn't live with him. I mean, he did what he did, and she did what she did. I, I could only go based on, on my experiences with Father, based on my own study of the principle. I'm confident I'm going to be fine. I'm not afraid to, to, to go. And none of us, we should be completely clear and, and not unafraid. If there's anything we want to go into the new year clear about, it's that God is with us. God is real. God, the living God, is with us. He's real. How amazing. How incredible. How wonderful. We have eternal life. You can't break the situation. In closing, I want to tell of a little funny experience I had on my way over here. I was driving here, just like last week. I'm driving and I'm, I'm you know, a lot of things are going through my mind. You know, I'm going to give this service. I'm gonna, there's so many things to talk about. I see so many things on TV. Last night was the debate. I mean, I didn't even mention the force. Oh my God, the force is out there now, right? Didn't even mention Star, Star Wars and the Force. I mean, what a cosmic happening. I mean, to me, it's personally deep. Remember, 1977, the first Star Wars came. Now we're, it's, everything's going in cycles. It's like the, the new Star Wars is here for the new generation, right? Our own sons and daughters. Anyway, I'm driving down the road and I'm thinking about terrorism and Muslims and President Obama and does he really know what's going on? And this kind of thing. And then uh, uh, this car pulls up next to me, and there's the Obama 08 bumper sticker. Obama 08, you know, from, from the election. And then I thought for a minute, and I thought to myself, John, you know, what do you really believe in? And I acknowledge, I'm going to stand here, I'm going to say to you, I very clearly believe that God wanted Barack Obama to be the President of the United States in 2008. I really believe that now. Because he's black. It was, it was the time in American history God wanted a President of this country who would represent black America. And the person that was there to do it at that time, the only person that you know could have been kind of manipulated into that, situation was Barack Obama. God wanted Barack Obama to be the president. I, I believe that now. Even though if I think of things from a political point of view or from a conservative's point of view or from a, a theological point of view or from a, a socialistic point of view, I can find fault, okay? But I know God wanted to be. So as I'm driving down the road and this car pulls up next to me and it has this Obama 08 sticker, I smiled to myself, and I said, yeah, this is God sort of rubbing it in my face a little bit, you know? And I sped up a little bit, and I turned and I looked inside the car, and it was a woman, a Muslim woman, driving the car with her Muslim headband on, and she's just driving the car down the road like this. And I just started laughing. I said, of course. <laughs> of course she would vote for Obama. A Muslim woman driving the car down the road. And I thought, wow, God is really rubbing it in my face. <laughs> but then I also thought, who is this woman? She's driving a car. She can't do that in Syria. She can't do that in Iran, for Iraq. She can't do that in the countries where the Muslims are in control. And she was all alone. She didn't have her husbands there or the men with her. She was driving down the road in a car that probably belonged to her. And for all I know, she might have been a single woman out on her own. She could have been a student at a university. She might have been a professional. Who knows? I thought. How ironic, really. You know? How ironic. How God works in mysterious ways. And I just felt to myself, 
No, God's really in charge. Don't worry. Don't worry about the small things because God is in charge. God knows better than us. And in the end, in the end, you know, when everything is said and done, we're only going to be judged and we're only going to be measured by how much we had mercy and compassion and concern and care for other people and how much we forgive people and how much we do not, do not try to force people to see things our way. Because what we, the way we see things today might not be the way we see things tomorrow. And we are all limited. We're all limited in our capacity, our capacity to know God's will. Okay, let us pray. Our Heavenly Parent God, I really pray that these words... I just hope and pray that they're true. I trust and have faith and confidence that you are truly our parent, that you have nothing but love and concern and care for each one of us, but not each one of us in this room. Every single person, every single human being that was ever born, that ever came into existence, you are their parent. You are the parent of each person even people that were born and lived thousands of years ago in some obscure part of this earth that never even became older than five or six years old and maybe they passed away and went into the spiritual world. You are their parent. You're the parent of every one of us. And you have created in the spiritual world an eternal place for us to live to ultimately find joy and happiness. Help us who are here now, who are alive today, who have had the opportunity, who have had the blessing to be able to meet the true parents, to learn from our true parents, to be educated by our true parents about this long history of restoration through indemnity, and that to be able to see the consummation of this process of restoration come to its fulfillment. Help us to, to, to manifest this love and this truth and this goodness. Please forgive us. We are small-minded and small-hearted, and we see things in such a narrow way. But help us to open our minds and our hearts and to appreciate you and appreciate our true parents, our true father and true mother, and appreciate the true children and the struggle that they've gone through to try to find their relationship with true parents. And every blessed family and every person, even people that 